Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Your Football Opinion. I am your host, Theo Ash, and today we are doing part two of the NFC Record Predictions. If you missed last week's episode, I did uh, the New Orleans one, had them going 10-7. and seven. Dallas, 11 wins, Carolina, just three. Minnesota, six, Philadelphia, nine, Atlanta, eight, San Francisco, 11, Chicago, eight. So that's what you missed last week. You can tune into that, that episode and hear my full explanations for all of those teams. If you are hearing this for the first time and instantly are struck disagreeing with the rankings. So go check that out if you haven't. Today, we have got Detroit, Arizona, Los Angeles, Green Bay, Tampa Bay, Seattle, New York, and Washington on the docket. So let's just get right into that. Detroit, I've got them going 11 and 5 after a 12, wait, 11 and 6. It's been 17 games for such a long time, guys, and my brain has never gotten used to it. Every year I've done record predictions. Every year there are multiple teams that I, I, I give the 16 game record to. Just aesthetically, I can't move past it. 11 and 5 just sounds right. 11 and 6 just doesn't even cross my mind. Sorry for that. But I, I got 11 and 6. They were 12. They were a 12 win team last year. I think they're about the same ca caliber, I would say, I, that things happen, you know. Um, 11 is about as much as I've predicted for any team. Uh, I think Detroit is still a, a heavy Super Bowl favorite or at least a favorite to get there out of the NFC along with the Packers and, and 49ers. I'd say it su would surprise me if it was not one of those three teams. I think that the defense is the main reason um, for optimism in Detroit. I think there could be some growing pains right away because they are relying on rookies and man coverage pretty early. Don't know if they'll be you know, prime Tyrion Arnold or prime Ennis Rakestraw day one. But they are good prospects. I did like what they did to that room. Arnold saw a lot of targets last year opposite of Kool-Aid McKinstry in Alabama. And locked up in man coverage, he could really match up with anybody. He had good size, like a kind of a sturdy frame. Really good ball skills created tons of just havoc plays, right? PBUs, interceptions, tackle for loss, forced fumbles. He was a corner that could actually stuff the stat sheet and create a game-changing play for you. Dennis Rakestraw Jr., not the fastest guy in the world, ran a disappointing 40 time, caused him to fall in the draft a little bit. But on tape and production-wise, like you did see some first-round ability there and I saw him in the first round of some mock drafts and it was easy to see why the dude reacted to everything so well so quickly that he made up for some of the lack of high-end athleticism with his IQ which I thought really was obvious did a great job versus LSU Brian Thomas Malik Neighbors Jaden Daniels and them didn't didn't really seem to look slow in that game they hardly even looked in his direction Ryan Branch, obviously, still in the fold. Carlton Davis, in addition, he's going to fit well with this man coverage scheme. Amik Robertson, we'll see. Yeah, he's been up and down with the, Ra with the Raiders. But um, overall, there's a good collection of talent here in the secondary. Uh, Melifon Wu, the safety, I think, could be a breakout. Uh, on top of Brian Branch, probably still in the nickel. I like I like that unit, but I don't think it's going to be maybe the best in the league. I don't know if I see someone who's going to be like all pro or anything like that, but it will be better. I don't know if there'll be a guaranteed 200 yards for any good wide receiver one that comes across the lines on the schedule anymore. I'm also really excited about the run defense. They added DJ reader lions fans. You can expect some incredible plays out of him for a big, big dude. He's very, flexible and fluid there's a famous play where he eats an initial double team and for a moment it looks like he's getting blown out of his gap he's like tilting he's anchoring down on just one leg the other one is like flying down in the air or flying around in the air and he's able to plant off that one leg regain control rock back into the other gap and make a tackle it happened against the Steelers I think if you follow my Twitter I've, I've shared it before it's 
but that's the kind of thing you can expect from him is just that ability to make run stops that no one else can make like there are dudes who have rare pass rush wins that everybody knows that when they see it like max crosby or something he'll have some spin move and sack the quarterback and everybody be like man that's special dj reader can't really do that in the passing game but i feel like he does have those big time splash plays in the running game and him alongside aleem mcneil it's going to be a major problem to to run between the tackles on these teams or on this team Aiden Hutchinson as well, good run defender. Marcus Davenport has length. Maybe he can uh, set a good edge. He hasn't had a lot of sack production in the last couple of years. But overall, these guys, with Anzalone behind them and Jack Campbell, they were a top-tier run defense last year. I think that they can really close any team trying to run downhill again this season, which is a big deal because that's a big part of the philosophy of the Packers and the 49ers. And it's an area where those two teams tend to struggle defending the run. So the Lions don't really have that type of problem. The only thing I'm really worried about this on this defense is maybe the pass rush. Hutchinson obviously has all kinds of different ways to get after the passer, probably the most diverse skill set of moves of any edge rusher Hutchinson has got. But outside of him, it is more run stuffing bodies than pass rushing bodies. And to get pressure, because they did get a lot of pressure last year, they a lot of the time insert a linebacker into the pass rush with a blitz, which just leaves more one-on-ones on the back end, which obviously did not work out well last year. This year, I think it'll work out a little better, but I don't think it's going to shoot them up to a maybe a top 10 passing defense. Although I don't think that's completely out of the question for this defense to be really good. I don't think it's completely out of the question. I just don't know if I'm betting on it. On the offensive side of the ball, things are still looking very good. I thought maybe last year they could regress. Uh, Ben Johnson have a bit of a sophomore slump or something like that. I mean, Goff definitely regressed over his time in L.A. Uh, He started with these really high highs with Sean McVay. The The records set. The Super Bowls gone to. You know, the conference championships won. But then as the years kind of went on, his limitations became more and more obvious. I was a little bit concerned about that starting right away. It didn't. Last year, he played at an even better level. He is cool, calm, collected, comfortable behind the best offensive line in the game. He really struggles under pressure, and um, he never feels like he's under pressure behind this Lions offensive line. And because of that belief, I think, when he's got full faith in the guys in front of him, he has become better at dealing with some pressure moments because I think he's just playing confident, like he can hit anything, like he can, and he knows where Amon Ra St. Brown is going to be, and, you know, Ben Johnson is one of those guys who's going to spam the crossing routes, the in-breakers, and allow for some yak, some ability to turn up field. Goff is playing very well within the structure of that. I don't think he has, like, MVP-type upside. I do think if there were any injuries and the depth of the offensive line got tested, you know, Goff isn't necessarily the one who's going to make everybody look great all the time if that happens but that's that's true for a lot of teams you know offensive line depth and issue if there's a bunch of major injuries like yeah the Lions won't be very good the thing I'm most worried about is the receiving core this is something I really harped on last offseason and it ended up burning me a little bit in that it didn't have any kind of impact on the Lions record I was really concerned about the receiver depth kept talking about it didn't really show up until the game against San Francisco. Last year, they finished third in yards per route run overall. They were one of the most productive passing offenses in the entire league, despite the fact that it was kind of top-heavy with just Amon Ross St. Brown and Sam Laporta. Obviously, last year, I, I didn't know Laporta was as good as he was. I liked him coming out of the draft, but that was a very pleasant surprise. This year... It's kind of the same deal. You've got Amon Ra, you've got Sam Laporta. Behind that, it's kind of a question mark. If they were a top three receiving core last year or passing offense last year, could it happen again? Absolutely. But we saw in the San Francisco game, crucial, crucial drops that cost them everything. Uh, From Josh Reynolds, who is gone now, but replaced by Khalif Raymond, who was playing behind Josh Reynolds last year. So how much of an upgrade is that really? And then uh, Jamison Williams dropped the flea flicker that went right through his hands. He's a a major deep threat. He gets separation, 
but how much of a catcher is he, right? I, I feel like we haven't seen Goff and him connect down the field very much so far. So how is that chemistry going to work out? I think it'll be fine for the most part, but I am worried about some of these big-time games late in the year in the playoffs in December to maybe decide the division against a, a, a Packers defense or a Bears defense that also looks quite good. Like, are we going to see a repeat of the San Francisco game where they desperately need someone to step up and that's Dan Campbell will be the first to admit it, right? They need someone to desperately step. They need someone desperately to step up. Is that a guarantee to happen? I, I don't think so at all. And I think that that could cost them big time, but there's still time to make a move, a trade. Tim Patrick is out there. I'd even like a move like that for them. Um, it, they can fill that void before the trade deadline. And that would make me feel a lot better about them. Uh, it's a very good team. I think if the Lions, Packers, or 49ers don't win the NFC, I would be pretty surprised. I think all of these teams should hover around the 11, 12, 13 win mark. Uh, I've got the Lions at 11 right now. Moving on to the Arizona Cardinals. This is one team I talked about on TikTok, so I'll keep it briefer. Basically, I love the offense. I do not love the defense at all. Um, I know that they have this reputation of being really scrappy under Jonathan Gannon and like it's the, the reputation for Gannon is he did a fantastic job with them last year. I don't know about all that. I don't know about all that because they were the worst defense in the league, you know, like, OK, they were scrappy. Sure. <laughs> there were some interesting schematic things that they were doing fine, but they were like dead last, you know, them in the the commanders were outliers in terms of how bad their defense was so how much credit can we really give the the defensive staff i'm always a bit hesitant um to give gannon too much credit before he's earned it as far as the work he's done on the defensive side of the ball now he didn't have any talent to work with i'm not saying like his schemes were horrible or anything like that uh you could have called pretty easily that they would be the worst defense last year just looking at them on paper and they were that's fine but i think you can kind of miss me with like Oh, they, they really outperformed expectations last year. We'll get to this year's version of the defense later, but I do want to talk about how great the offense is, in my opinion. I really, really like that side of the ball, and I think it will keep them at least in the hunt. When you look at teams in the playoffs, usually the thing that correlates the most strongly is the strength of their passing offense. Kyler Murray, really good quarterback, in my opinion, did a nice job last year playing in a more structured offense, not so many just hitches and goes that Cliff Kingsbury likes to call, not as much scrambling around, you know, more control pre-snap, a higher run rate, a higher rate throwing over the middle of the field. I thought I thought he piloted it, it all beautifully coming back from the injury. And actually, the, the Cardinals were a top 10 offense when, when Kyler Murray came back from injury week 10 and on. And that was him not quite playing to his strengths. They didn't have a presence on the boundary that he really trusted. So he was more focused in on the middle of the field. Guys like Trey McBride, Greg Dorch, those were the dudes who demanded a lot of his target share last season. You would think Kyler would be way better targeting the boundary because he's a shorter guy. Excuse me, because he's a shorter guy, because he struggles sometimes to see some of those middle of the field targets over interior offensive linemen like that. And those moments did crop up sometimes in every game, but he also did uh, well to get results. Now he's got Marvin Harrison Jr. for the full year. He's got Michael Wilson week one onwards. Last year, they never really quite clicked. Wilson was hurt when Kyler kind of first came back. They weren't on the same page for a long time. Started to look better towards the end. I'm excited to see a full season of those two together. Greg Dorch fits in very nicely as the 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 small slot guy. Uh, I, I love Greg Dorch. He's a great blocker for his size. Good yak threat. Good route runner. Um, just as a wide receiver one in the offense last year, or as the the main guy Kyler was maybe looking at, just didn't quite work out well. Not the not the way you want a receiving core to be constructed. But now I think it's constructed kind of beautifully. At least the top three are. I love all three of those guys in the roles that they're in. With McBride, with James Conner, who's coming off a career-high season, with an offensive line that I think is 
pretty good. I think it's fine. I like the center for Holtz. Paris Johnson Jr. had a decent rookie year. Um, they added Jonah, Jonah Williams. I don't, I'm a little bit concerned about the loss of Humphreys and going to Williams. I thought Humphreys played fine last year. Williams is maybe a bit more of an unknown coming in as a free agent. The Bengals let go. Obviously, that line wasn't always uh, solid uh, during Williams' times there. So the line, I think, is average, but the receiving core and quarterback are good enough where I think that this can be a top 10 offense like it was at the end of last year. And get them to a couple wins. The problem is now going back to the defense. I really like Buda Baker. I'll say that. I think he's still a, a top-tier safety. The way he flies around is like no other. He can put out a lot of fires. But everyone outside of him needs to kind of show me something. Last year, Dennis Gardeck was their sack leader. And he's nice, but uh, he's not quite the dude who's going to bring the consistent power to get double-digit sacks in a season or or a 20% pressure rate or and be good in, against the run at the same time. He's a good player, but as your leading as your leading guy, you need a bit more size. You need a bit more strength. They're hoping to get that in Darius Robinson. He definitely provides it. Long, like grown-ass man, brings the power, but kind of only brings the power, right? Uh, not maybe a refined technician at this point in his career and I don't know if he'll ever become quite that but he is going to be a, an angry long force in, in the middle of the defense that they were certainly lacking last year I still just wonder like where does all the pass rushing production come from they brought back Zayvon Collins good outside linebacker in this scheme Gannon loves to drop defensive linemen into coverage um or drop outside linebackers into coverage. Maybe both of them rush three. He's a big fan of doing that. Um, so everybody's got to be able to cover a little bit uh, in the linebacker room. Gardeck, same thing. He's got to be able to go backwards as well as forward. I like the Xavier Thomas pickup. He's had a good preseason. Maybe he can add a bit more juice. Overall, it's it's a better front seven now that I'm talking about it. But still. Bilal Nichols starting, Justin Jones in the starting lineup, Dante Stills in the starting lineup right now, although Darius Robinson should probably surpass him. That's probably just a rookie thing. The linebackers, Mac Wilson and Kaiser White off the ball, that's really bad. It was a major position of weakness last year. Couldn't get off blocks, not quite sure where to go against uh, some of the eye candy in their division. Like That's probably still going to be a massive problem. The secondary... They're going to be playing up top in the, in this quarters heavy system, you know, jumping on everything in front of them. I think they have some intriguing guys for that. Max Melton was a guy out of the draft that I liked. Dadrian Taylor, Dadrian Taylor, Demerson. I'm sorry, I'm botching that name, but he had a ton of picks last year. Good preseason. Maybe they can have a really good interception differential. But I am still worried about the consistency of this secondary. Uh, I didn't think Jalen Thompson, the other safety outside of Baker, had a great season last year. Uh, if they run into a high-powered offense, a high-powered receiving core, a quarterback that can take care of the ball, I don't know how many offenses they'll be completely stopping. I think that they're going to be in a lot of shootouts. I think it might be a good idea to take their over every week. Um, I do think that they're going to scratch and claw and win some games like they did last season when Kyler came back. Big game against the Eagles on the road. Beat the Steelers on the road. They were a playoff team. You know, don't think they'll be bad. I think they'll actually be a scrappy, surprising team because I do weight the offense a little heavier. But I think they'll fall just short of the playoffs. I've got them at 8 and 9, which would be a very successful season for them in year 2 of this rebuild. They're kind of a year away from being uh, a year away. Next up, we've got the Los Angeles Rams, and I generated the order that I'm going in in a random in a random list generator. Arizona and L.A. fell right next to each other, and following up this L.A. prediction with what I just said about Arizona makes it even scarier to say. But I think I think Arizona could finish ahead of the Rams in the division this year. The Rams are a team I am low on right now 
I think they could finish fourth. I've got them going seven and 10, ladies and gentlemen, seven and 10. That is their floor. I am scared to be the one to say that, but it's bold. And here is why I think it. I, I, I feel like nobody's talking about the fact that they lost Aaron Donald. That's kind of what it comes down to. They had the greatest defensive player maybe of all time playing, maybe not at the very peak of his powers, but pretty damn close last season. Like he was playing at an all pro level again. He is now gone, leaving Braden Fisk, Kobe Turner, Byron Young, and Jared Verse, which is fine. It's fine. But I didn't love their draft. I think Verse is kind of a one-trick pony. Like, he can, he can go right down someone's frame, reverse pancake them right where he's the one running over the offensive lineman. I saw that a few times on his Florida State film, him and Fisk involved with some great stunts. But how do they translate to the NFL level? I don't know. Whenever Verse got a chance to round the corner in college, it seemed like he slipped. Don't really think he has much bend. Don't really think he has a full arsenal of moves right now. I think tackles are just going to be able to sit on his bull rush, and I don't think he's going to be crazy effective right away. Braden Fisk, like, very active. They described him, what, as like a, a rolling ball of daggers or something like that, just someone who is going to slice right through you. And, and he can't, he's capable of it. Like he's definitely active. He'll spring moves together. But I also think with Fisk, there's a lot of wasted motion in his game. He's kind of spamming moves and a lot of the time not really getting anywhere. And then against the run, that's where I'm really concerned that you can run downhill right at him and like spinning around three times doesn't really help you. It just moves you like kind of farther out of the gap. So if, if those two are your answer to replace Donald, like I don't think even combined they're going to, to hit his level of impact at all. Kobe Turner taking another leap is probably your best bet. I really do like him. And again, overall, all four of them have some potential. But I just don't know. I just don't know if this is going to be a top-tier pressure team at all and they've lost Raheem Mostert who did a great job scheming up uh, some fire zones manufacturing pressure in that way like is the new DC going to be as talented I like Ernest Jones I like Darius Williams I like Cam Curl but none are quite stars and then I am concerned overall about the secondary still uh, Tredavious White is going to be leaned on as a starter early he's been fine when he's healthy recently but he is older and coming off several major injuries now. If that depth gets tested and the pass rush takes a step back, I do think this offense, this defense has a chance to be kind of in the bottom tier. It could be good if everybody's healthy. The rookies hit their ceiling. Maybe I'm too low on them, but I just I think they're going to go through injuries like every defense does, and I just don't think they're going to get as much out of their top two draft picks as I'd as you'd like to see trying to replace Donald. On offense, love the offense. I still do. Like Matthew Stafford, goaded. Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, goaded. Bit concerned about the offensive line already, though. Alaric Jackson suspended. Jonah Jackson has dealt with injuries all training camp. Rob Havenstein, questionable. You've already, you're already seeing that depth get tested. Tyler Higby out probably for the beginning of the year. Cooper Cup been very banged up recently. And even Matthew Stafford's health, I don't think, is a complete guarantee over the course of the year. And their backup quarterback situation is atrocious. Jimmy Garoppolo suspended for PEDs. What is he going to look like when he comes back? Stetson Bennett behind him. Like, if we have to see any Stetson Bennett this year, it's very over. I don't know. I am just not totally moved by this team as a whole i like some of the stars but i do think it's kind of a stars and scrubs -y type of roster like it was two years ago when they missed the playoffs after making the super bowl now could they potentially see a bit of a step back after making the playoffs again kind of up down up down up down i don't know i don't know i just don't think it's any guarantee that this team is like super great and i just love so many of the other teams in this division i i I think the Cardinals are built in a similar way. Great offense, really questionable defense. And they have the much easier schedule as a fourth place team. Look at the Rams schedule. They start with, let's see here. 
the Lions, the Cardinals, the 49ers, the Bears, and the Packers. The first five weeks of the season, like I'm, I'm only favoring them probably in through two of those games. I think the Bears could definitely beat them. I think, again, they, they're kind of even with the Cardinals. And then asking them, and then, I, like I said earlier, the Lions, 49ers, and Packers are my three favorite teams in the conference by far. Like, I think, like, right off the bat, they're going to be really tested and in a tough division. I think it's going to be hard to make up ground. I don't know. It's a bold take, certainly. I think this is a floor. If I wanted to be more safe, I'd say Los Angeles 9-8, and eight, something like that. No one would be mad at me. But I, I think it's a disappointing year in L.A. I'm going 7-10. and 10. Green Bay next. I really like the Packers, as you all know. And the first episode of this podcast was saying that they will represent the NFC in the Super Bowl and then lose to the Ravens. I just like what they've got going on, man. I, I think that they have depth in a lot of different places. I don't really see a weak link unit on the team. I like their receiving core. I like that they are deep there. They kind of have the opposite problem that the the Lions have, where you're wondering who the high-end guy is, but you're not wondering about wide receiver four, right? Um, I, I almost prefer that, like... If you're in Detroit, you're not really going anywhere unless Jamison Williams takes a leap, I'd say. The Packers have a prospect that's very similar, who could give them kind of the same thing, has the same kind of upside, has had more success in his career. That's Christian Watson. But if he doesn't become the best wide receiver on the team or, or, or a, a thousand yard receiver, I'd say, the Packers aren't, you know, done. Or that they can still win the Super Bowl without that happening, and I, I don't. I think Christian Watson is just as safe of a bet to break out as like Jameson Williams is, right? You know what I mean? I just think there's a lot of meat on the bone here, like Jordan Love playing at an MVP level the back half of last season. What if he just continues that? I definitely think he's got more potential to carry a team in the playoffs or through injuries than Jared Goff does. And then on defense, like comparing them to the Lions again, and I like the secondary better. Jair Alexander is a potential, you know, all pro star. Eric Stokes has been good when he's healthy. He just needs to stay healthy, you know. That's a big if, I know. Keyshawn Nixon in the slot, I'm worried about. I'll say that. <laughs> like, I don't think that he's a, a great corner. But Xavier McKinney, it's a good ad. Javon Bullard, it's a good ad. I think their their secondary improvements are on par with what the Lions did, at the very least. You know, when they when they beat the Chiefs last year, the Packers, when they beat the the Lions, they didn't have a lot of these players. Jair, Bullard, McKinney, Stokes. I don't think any of those guys were playing. It was just Nixon. And they still won those big games last year. Now you're getting an infusion of a ton of talent, presuming health. It's a big presumption. I get it. But Everybody's excited about what the Lions added in the secondary. It's rookies. I'm excited that the Packers have added some more established talent there, and I think that that could pay off at least here in year one. Maybe eventually, Rake Straw and uh, and them are like have developed into something better than Eric Stokes. Terry and Arnold has developed into something better than Eric Stokes. I could definitely see that, but. Uh, for year one, I, I do like kind of the vet names that I see here. The front four is also going to be a bit better at getting after the passer than like the Lions, I would say. Uh, Rashawn Gary, love him. Uh, I know that the production hasn't always been there with the sacks, but he was going to have that type of season in 2022 before he tore his ACL. I know it. I know it. They kind of worked him back slowly in 2023. He did not play a very high volume of the snaps. Um, he has the highest pressure rate or the second highest pressure rate behind Micah Parsons over the last three years. I don't know. I mentioned that on the other pod, but I think the sacks will eventually come with him. Kenny Clark, very disruptive guy. Preston Smith, solid. TJ Slate. Well, we'll see about the, that, th that third, um, spot or that fourth spot on the defensive line filled by either Slate nor Wyatt is intriguing. Wyatt has really flashed and has a high pressure rate. He just hasn't been able to finish plays. But overall, I think these four combined have a bit more 
juice to get after the passer than most other NFC teams. I think the Packers could be a top five sacking team and a top five sack avoidance team, which is absolutely huge, I think. So we'll see what they get out of the defense. I know the the story has always been they have all this talent and they just never can get a defensive coordinator to get the most out of it, I guess. Um, I could definitely see that being a story again this year. I think the Lions' defense could actually be a little bit better. Um, I know I'm just comparing them to the Lions right now, but I think it's a good way to look at it, honestly, is like who is going to finish first in this division, who is going to be the better team here that's probably going to be potentially the one seed in the whole NFC, you know. So that's why I'm comparing them to them. It's a good roster. I think they can do it. I think the defense can have average results. I'm not even asking for top 10, just average with an offense that continues the results we saw from the back half of last year. That's the script. That's the story. I think it's possible. I'm going 12 and five here for the Packers. Again, it shouldn't be shocking. I said they'd win the NFC in the first episode of this podcast. Going to keep, uh, going to keep pounding that drum. Next up. We have got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They concern me a little bit because of how inefficient they were on early downs last year and how good they were on third and long. That's something that raises some regression red flags. Like if you're constantly living, converting third and eight, third and nine with incredible catches from Mike Evans, like it's tough to bank on that year after year after year, especially with when your quarterback is a guy like Baker Mayfield who has never been consistent. Now, part of the reason that they were always in these third and long situations was because Canales was so kind of stubborn running the ball, and he's proud of that. But I don't know if it was always the best idea, these run-run-pass sequences when you have the worst offensive line or the worst run offensive line in the league last year. Couldn't convert third and short, fourth and short situations. Couldn't gain more than four yards per carry on the ground. Most games, like it was, it was rough. I think him going to Carolina might not be the worst thing in the world for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He did some nice things, streamlining Baker's process. Okay, get him an empty. Just I talked about this with the Panthers in the last episode, but get him an empty, simulate some of the looks that he was getting when he was playing so well at Oklahoma, right? Heisman winner, spread everybody out. I, I don't think that that's going away from the Tampa Bay offense, though. Just because Canales left doesn't mean that's not still a good idea. So I think they can do that and potentially streamline their running attack this year instead of just spamming, you know, runs between the tackles on first down. This year, their run defenses or their run blocking is going to be a little better with Graham Barton. Use it maybe a little bit at smarter times. Maybe that can make sure their regression on third down doesn't happen if they're, if they're being put in easier third down situations, which I could definitely see this season. But overall, I still think the, the ceiling of the unit is capped as long as Baker is your quarterback. Just don't love him, his decision making his pocket presence. Um, he, they ran a lot of play action last year, and he wasn't very good <laughs> with the play action last season, turning his back to the defense, turning back around. The picture is different, like not a big Baker fan when that is the, the type of thing that you're dealing with with him. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's going to be fine. Maybe it's enough to, to win the NFC South or be the best offense in the NFC South. Not a very high bar, though. Defense intrigues me a little bit as well, but again, there are some weaknesses. There are some question marks. Uh, the secondary of Jamel Dean and um, Zion McCollum, is that really going to hold up all season? I like Izian in the slot. I like Winfield at safety, but I am a bit worried about this team being taken advantage of deep down the sideline. And then the pass rush, it will be there because because Todd Bowles is going to generate it with his blitz packages. But I also want to be able to get pressure just rushing four. 
And right now, that other edge spot is still Joe, Joe Tryon Shoyinka, first rounder who has not lived up to the hype. Yaya Diaby had a good rookie season, a decent rookie season, but is it good enough that I can project him to be a top tier edge rusher next year? I don't know. Vita Vea, more of a run stuffer than a than a pass rusher, although he's very, very good. And then Cansey is the one that gets me the most excited. I think Cansey could get, have a ton of sacks next year. Uh, he, he he worried me coming out because he was so small, but it didn't really seem to affect him too much that first year. I, I think like his style of play as a small defensive lineman seems to translate a little bit better than like Fisk's kind of just wild, like out of control style. I think Cansey knows what he's doing and kind of knows how to use his size kind of to an advantage slipping between doubles, which I think some of these smaller guys still have to learn. So he, he, he intrigues me. Dabby intrigues me a bit, but Levante David, obviously still there. I thought he had an extremely good season last year, but Overall, this roster is just a bit old, and there are still some holes that make me think they're going to be mid next season. And I think the the Saints and the Falcons are going to take a bit of a step forward. The Bucks, I think, will take a bit of a step back. Um, they're kind of running things back, and my general thought is if you stayed the same, maybe you maybe you got worse a little bit and maybe that's unfair. They didn't stay the exact same, but their there's their emphasis has always been bring guys back, bring guys back, bring guys back. It's not a bad strategy, but I don't know if it'll be enough this season. I don't know if it'll be enough this season. I got them going. We'll say eight wins. We'll, we'll say eight and nine. Seattle next. I really like the Seattle Seahawks. I think they can get back to the du double digit win mark. I am a, Big, big fan of the Mike McDonald hire as the head coach. Had a lot of success against some of these shanahan -y trees last year. Shanahan himself uh, obviously shut him down in that Ravens versus 49ers game over the holidays in prime time. Brock Purdy threw four interceptions. It was a drubbing. It was a drubbing. They beat the, they beat the Dolphins like what was it like 56 to 19 or something like that? <laughs> like, damn, you know, this, this dude is, uh, has some success against the top tier OCs, which is very important in this division. You got McVeigh, you got Shanahan. Um, you're going to need somebody who can go toe to toe with them on the defensive side of the ball. And that was kind of the thing that sunk Pete Carroll. I think Mike McDonald has the talent to do it and the guys. I remember going into the Ravens season last year. I definitely wasn't expecting this top, top tier defense because who is going to be able to rush the passer like one-on-one? -on -one? Um, it didn't really seem like they had the bodies to be able to do that. It seemed like they might be too dependent on the blitzes. Um, but Matabike broke out and the blitzes were just that good, right? Like you got Patrick Queen coming downhill and like taking out your entire offensive line. It makes things pretty easy for Matabike, right? Like he, he really can design, I think, pressure at a, a very high level. And they actually have guys who can win one-on-one -on -one this year. Uh, Byron Murphy, the second, their high draft pick, I believe can do it. Leonard Williams. Um, Boy Amafe has got one move in his bag, but I guess he can win. Um, Uchenna Nuos, who gets hurt, that's a bit of a tough blow. Jaron Reed, he had a resurgent season last year. He had played extremely well after I thought he was washed for the Packers last year. None of these names may be stars or, or moving you to an insane extent, but it is, I think, better than what the Ravens had in the cupboard rushing the passer last year. Draymond Jones, haven't even mentioned him. Derek Hall has had an insane preseason. He looks like the strongest outside linebacker in the league, the way he's been bull rushing people and putting them on their ass. I just think there's a lot here to work with, a lot of volume, if, even if there's not kind of high-end talent. And then in the secondary, there's a lot of talent as well. I think, you know, Reek Willen, I, I know the caliber of rookie season he had. He was absolutely fantastic. Looked like he was on a, a Hall of Fame path. Last year, 
way, way worse, obviously. Um, didn't have the same type of success, but man, I'm, I'm kind of falling in love all over again, watching some of these preseason, these preseason clips, the way he's able to stay with people, the way he's able to be elastic and like, he'll, he'll two hand jam you like lose like whiff and still cover you perfectly because his lower body is like that twitched up and he's got that kind of length. I think maybe he'll always be an inconsistent player, but I, I do think he can have a coverage season again, like he did his rookie season. And then there's Devon Witherspoon, who is just an all around beast. I think Rayshon Jenkins was a good safety pickup. Julian Love, I don't know. They just paid him after he was a free agent signing and didn't quite live up to it. We'll see with him, but the, the talent is there. And again, if, if we're working with the theory that Mike McDonald can get the most out of these guys and he already has a lot of established good players to work with, like like Witherspoon, like Williams. Um, I guess Byron Murphy the second is isn't an established good player because he's a rookie, but I think it's a good bet that he is good. I think this defense is going to take a big leap from where they were at last year. Maybe it's not quite at Ravens level. Maybe there still needs to be a lot of team building to do before they get there, but I do think that... Uh, Last season, the defense was extremely disappointing. I do think it was more of a coaching issue than a talent issue. It's also a bit of a Bobby Wagner issue, having like a washed linebacker out there like that that can't cover anybody or have any range. Like losing Jordan Brooks is a bit tough, but losing Bobby Wagner kind of makes it so this linebacker core to me is about the same as it was last year. And then I, I really like this offense. I really do. I think that Geno Smith is an elite quarterback, really. Like pocket presence, accuracy, arm talent, aggressiveness. It is all there for him at a very high level. I think that makes you elite. I know he said to Dan Orlovsky, let's see that elite list. Let's revisit that. You're sharing my highlights in the spree season. You know I can make exciting throws. Like, why am I not on the uh, that top tier list? I think that he, he does deserve a spot. Um, he does deserve top 10 consideration. I think he can carry this team to, to a playoff spot. And I mean... It's tough to carry them to a division title with the 49ers in town, but I, I think the Seahawks are going to contend with them this year. I love Kenneth Walker the third as well. Um, I think he's been dealing with a horrific offensive line in front of him, and he has still managed to be extremely explosive. People question his vision, like, oh, he does so much dancing in the backfield. In his case, I think it's valid because he is explosive enough to pull these types of things off. And what else do you want him to do, man? I think he gets north and south when it's time. A lot of the times he's forced to go east and west. There's, there's nowhere. To, that's the only way that there's a play there. So I think no matter what the offensive line looks like, you can hand the ball off to Ken Walker and, and have a, at least a little bit of success, at least rip off some big runs. And I think that he's one of the more, maybe the most, I, I think he is the most underrated back in the league because of, um, because of that, I, I think that he doesn't really have a lot of big fans. The analytics community, I feel like, doesn't really like him because he hasn't been very efficient. I think there's a lot of film people out there who do think he dances around too much. I, I don't share that opinion. I think that he's, he's top 10. DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, that's a good three. I think that Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to take a leap. Loved him coming out of Ohio State. Did not see him as a slot-only guy at all. I thought... They didn't do a good job getting him started in this offense. A lot of screens, a lot of short A dot stuff. When they started unlocking him farther down the field, the results started to, to follow. And I think this year it's going to pick up where it left off and he's going to surpass Tyler Lockett. And it wouldn't surprise me if he even surpassed DK Metcalf as the number one guy. I think that's a bit, it would surprise me maybe if he, he surpassed Metcalf. But I do think he's going to be the second receiver after Lockett. And I, I'm in on him in fantasy, I'll say that. Noah Fant as well, not a bad receiving option. And then I still believe in this offensive line a little bit. Charles Cross, Abe Lucas, it should be a good tackle duo. Christian Haynes was a good draft pick for them. Um, Connor Williams was a good, is a fine center. Like there's, it's not a great line, certainly. I think there's going to be problems. I think on third down and long, they're going to run into some issues. But they went through 10 different iterations and combinations last year. I think the health is going to improve and we're going to see a return more of 2022 levels of offense with a Mike McDonald defense. I think this team is a contender. I do. 
I think they're a dark horse contender, and I got them at 10 and 7. Next up, the New York Giants. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. It's the, the offense here, Daniel Jones, I don't believe in him. Uh, that's not a shocking take, but I, I think that it could actually be the, the worst quarterback situation in the league all of a sudden. I mean, the preseason game he played, he throws a pick six. He throws another pick to Stingley. He throws it right at Stingley again, hits him in the chest. How many years is it, has it been? that he's been the starter and he's given them no positive results over the course of the season. Well, maybe it's 2022 that's positive results, but even then 15 passing touchdowns, even if he's operating at the peak of his powers. Um, I don't think Dable is going to be able to rekindle the close game magic that they had in 2022. And best case scenario is they just win a bunch of close games and it's kind of like a bullshit 10 and 10 win season. Um, Neighbors might unlock some things. I think that he is obviously a, a pretty special prospect in terms of the speed that he possesses, the way he's able to attack the ball in the air, um, the way he's able to take even like a hitch 50 yards after the catch to the house. He's certainly going to help some things out, but I, I don't buy this idea that it's going to be like Burrow and Chase, you know, like that he's going to totally unlock the downfield aspect of everything. I mean, it's been it's been a lot of times that Daniel Jones has gotten a weapon and just nothing has come of it. Darren Waller, who I didn't even think played like that bad last season, but obviously he didn't really help much in terms of Daniel Jones's standing. Kenny Galladay, he was a big addition. He didn't do anything. Kadarius Tony was a first round pick. He didn't do anything like obvious neighbors is a safer bet to do something than all of these guys like they were all flawed they were all playing f like fine or bad decent or bad by the time they got to the giants but all of those guys falling way short of expectation does make me a bit nervous about just this environment with this offensive line and this quarterback and this running back situation too right like they're not going to be able to hand the ball off and create explosive plays at the same rate that they were these last few years so the idea of like force feeding neighbors making this offense anything more than a bottom 10 unit like i i just i don't see that i, th I think they're pretty much guaranteed to be pretty bad not shocking they got a new offensive line coach but just the offensive linemen they brought in might be too far gone. Like at this point, I'll believe it when I see it with Evan Neal, uh, the center out of Minnesota as well, really struggled as a rookie. I just think this this whole team build is kind of doomed. And I and I look at how they've approached this off season, and I'm like, how is it okay? They've made improvements, right? They they've they've brought in Brian Burns, they've brought in. Guys like Tyler Newbin in the draft that people are excited about, Malik Neighbors, obviously. But it just overall looks about the same as it did at the beginning of last offseason. Instead of Saquon Barkley to create explosives, they have Malik Neighbors. Instead of Leonard Williams to get pressure, they have Brian Burns. And guess what? They had like the exact same pressure rate last season at, at I think, 13%. Exact same. Exact same amount of uh, knockdowns as well. So... Okay, Brian Burns is cool. He's an edge rusher instead of a defensive tackle. Congratulations. The, the positional value machine pats you on the back for doing that. But trading away Leonard Williams and then getting Brian Burns, like if we're moneyballing this and looking at the pressure numbers, like you're just getting the exact same results at a, on the edge instead of in the interior. And I don't know if that actually matters much. They got rid of Xavier McKinney as well. And so if you, even if you aren't buying my Leonard Williams and Brian Burns are equal thing, how about this? Like Xavier McKinney and Leonard Williams is about the same as Brian Burns and the rookie Tyler Newbin. So they're just kind of spinning their wheels. I know they've kind of made this roster their own now, Joe Shane and company. Okay, it's their own roster. It's not any better though, is it? Or not much better. So I, I think we can expect the same mid results that we've seen out of the Giants recently. I got them at five and twelve. Next and finally, we have the Washington Commanders. Just don't like the way they built 
this team at all. I mean, they wanted Ben Johnson. They didn't get him. They got Cliff Kingsbury. They probably wanted Caleb Williams. They didn't want him. They got Jaden Daniels, which I think was the wrong pick over Drake May. Dan Quinn is the head coach. I was complaining all last season about how his defense just isn't really suited for the modern game. I said that they were kind of fraudulent because they just cannot stop any kind of Shanahan system that they're going to face in the playoffs. And sure enough, like they got shredded immediately. Like that was some stuff that was easy to predict in week four that the, the defense would really struggle against any kind of good offense. Okay, so that's those are your main core pieces. Quinn, Kingsbury, Daniels. I think like those three all could have been better this offseason. And just right then and there, it makes me very skeptical of how this team can perform when I don't like those crucial, crucial spots. Jaden Daniels, though, he he is better than Sam Howe, I think. I don't think he's going to take like 60 sacks and throw 20 picks. In fact, I know that he's he's going to protect the football better than that. I know. I know. But I don't know. Like, when has Cliff Kingsbury won anything, you know? Like, when has his offense started good and finished good even or finished fine? It's always a disaster by the end. With his quarterback banged up, I feel like, and just predictable, stale concepts. Already we've got Terry McLaurin lining up just on the left side, 28 of the 29 plays that he played this uh, preseason or whatever. They do that so they can play fast, right? They can up the tempo. It's simple. Everybody knows where they're going to line up, but so does the defense. And I, I said this on Stay Hot, I know, but I'm scarred by those images of DeAndre Hopkins' next-gen stats route trees where it's just out, 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 all from the same spot. And I'm watching these preseason games, and I'm looking at what Jaden Daniels is doing. He's not asked to do anything real all preseason. It's just hit the top of your drop, throw a hitch, throw a hitch, throw a hitch, throw a hitch. He threw one go, right? He, but he audibled out of his screen, right? <laughs> he audibled out of his screen to, to hit that play. Like, Cliff Kingsbury didn't do that. So um, I'm just a little bit worried about where the big chunk play or the, the easy way to generate explosives comes from. The go balls are great. Like, maybe it'll be that. But go balls are only going to make up, like, 10% of your offense. Are there going to be crossers? Are they going to be digs? Are there going to be ways to get the ball in the hands of your playmakers in creative ways? No, I don't think. It's going to be hit a go, scramble, or, you know, probably throw it to a guy standing still in a spot where they will line up on every play before that and every play after that. Just not a fan. Not a fan of Kingsbury. Daniels, I think if, if he was asked to to – perform a full drop back offense, reading things out left to all the way to right con consistently, like not a lot of help with RPOs and things like that. I do think he would struggle. Uh, I talked about this, but the only play where I really saw a big time drop back from him this preseason was a, was a blitz where he just sailed the ball out of bounds immediately. Like didn't really try to solve any problems there. So I don't know this whole offense, the offensive line, remained largely undressed all off season. The receiver room is, I like Deami Brown. I'll say that. Like I like McLaurin and Deami Brown with Jaden Daniels, a skill set. I both, I think both of those guys can win down the field and track it over their shoulder. I think, uh, I, I mean, watching Jaden Daniels at ASU, he had Ayuk and then he had Frank Darby and they would both run go routes down either sideline. And he would just kind of pick his spot based on where their safeties were going. And both of those could pay him off, even though, one of them was the big star, right, Ayuk. The other one could pay it off just as well. Then you go to LSU. You get kind of the same team build. You've got Neighbors. He's the main star on one side of the field. But you've got Brian Thomas Jr. on the other who can also cash in big plays. you got Terry McLaurin now. And then I think uh, a guy like Deami Brown can fit in kind of in that other vertical threat role. Zacchaeus is a good depth piece as well. Um, he was very efficient for the Eagles last year. I actually think Washington did a good job with the trade. Uh, they signed Zacchaeus for four million bucks, got a day two pick for Dotson. I would prefer if the Eagles got Zacchaeus for four million bucks and didn't give up a day two pick for Dotson. Right? I think the the Commanders did the more efficient thing there. So 
I, I like that. I think Luke McCaffrey is an interesting player. Um, I'm intrigued by the the receiving room, but it's also not guaranteed to be like great. I would say when Dami Brown and Zacchaeus and Luke McCaffrey are your second best guy there. Zach Ertz is your starting tight end, you know. So offense, I think some games there will be explosions, but I also think some games it'll look like a complete disaster. And then the defense, I don't know, man. I guess I like the pass rush a decent amount. Jonathan Allen is a good player. They added Johnny Newton. Um, we haven't really seen him much. It seems like that foot issue is serious. That's why he fell to the second round. But he was a top 10 prospect to me. I mean, he won constantly throughout the course of an entire game. It was just win, 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 win with him. Um, some of the most dominant defensive performances I've ever scouted with, with Johnny Newton. So I'm excited about him and Allen and Payne. But, like, how often is Newton going to see the field? But behind those two guys, right, it's built very much through the interior. The edge rushers are Doris Armstrong and Cleveland Farrell, who are, who are fine, but you'd prefer them to be depth pieces, right, and not starting defensive ends for you. Luvu can obviously come downhill. Bobby Wagner can come downhill and still make an impact. The problem is they can only come down – like, maybe they can only come downhill, especially Wagner. Like, this linebacker room is not going to be able to cover anybody. And then the – Secondary also might not be able to cover too many people. Like Emmanuel Forbes was an all-time draft bust, it seems, um, already effectively replaced in the starting lineup by guys like Michael Davis, who <laughs> has faced his share of problems as a starting corner as well. I like the Sandra still pickup, um, but I don't know. I just think that Dan Quinn is going to play a ton of man coverage and blitz, and I just don't think they quite have the bodies to be doing that, like any kind of tight end. I guess they got chin to do that kind of dirty work, but eventually, like starting Bobby Wagner, I think automatically puts such a cap on your defense. And then on top of that, like you don't have a Michael Parsons. Just just not seeing it with either of these units. I think Washington is going to be one of the worst teams this year. I've got them going three and 14. Three and 14, kind of a brutal rookie season. For the Jaden Daniels era. So that is how I've got it all shaken out. The one seed would be Green Bay. Oh boy. I don't know if that'll actually happen, but we'll see. The one seed would be Green Bay in my world. The two seed, San Francisco. The three seed, Dallas. The four seed, New Orleans. And then in the wild card, we'd have Detroit. We'd have Seattle, Philadelphia. Mm hmm. Yep. Seems about right to me. <laughs> it should. I'm the one who picked it. Yeah, those are those are the playoff teams. Who else would make it? Minnesota, no. Chicago, maybe. Atlanta, maybe. But I think those are per I think those are somewhat valid. There's no, there's nothing too crazy happening there. The craziest take I have is is Los Angeles finishing fourth in the division. I'm running back my other take. One of my best record predictions ever was the the Rams missing the playoffs after they they won the Super Bowl. I, I'm just running that one back. It worked for me before. Like, why why not try again after the Aaron Donald retirement? But that'll do it for the episode. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast to all PFN content at PFN 365 on all social platforms. And then you can look at my individual work at the OASH NFL on Twitter and TikTok. Thank you so much for listening. I will see you next week as we begin the AFC playoff predictions, in my opinion, the more exciting conference. So stay tuned for that. And I'll see you then.